Hello, welcome to our talk. My name is Chris, and together with Tinko, we're going to take you on a short journey how we adapted cloud native tools to build our data analytics platform, and how the recent addition to that stack with those advanced schedulers help us to uh, you know, achieve a bigger scale or operate in that uh, multi tenant environment. So that's going to be our story, uh, but uh, just to begin with, we're going to introduce to, uh, you to our company. So ING is a financial institution uh, that operates globally with, uh, with European Europe. Uh, we have over 52,000 employees uh, working for us. Uh, yeah, we tr our mission is to empower people to stay ahead in life and business. Uh, also, the roots of the company are from the deep economic crisis of the 20s, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, our mission right now is also to help to transition our world into the new era with, uh, uh, to shift to the low carbon future and to sp speed up the innovation in finance. Being like over 10 years in that banking industry is also a fascinating uh, area where a lot of regulations are there. So it's uh, adopting a new technology, it's never easy, but also gives you, uh, because one of the most important thing in the bank is trust. So that was the way we want to handle data with respect to whatever uh, it's only required to, to the data to be handled and to you know, respect your right uh, in that regard. The mission uh, for the company, but the mission for our platform is uh, to become a data driven. What we want to emphasize here is like uh, support our employees with the self-service platform. So we are in a platform economy and what, what, what we build, the mission is to empower you to build on top of that platform and to solve the, the business needs. The growth factor. So we started around 2018. The platform roots are in 2013 when we started adopting open source technology to bootstrap the uh, product initiatives. Uh, in 2018, we are starting to look in the new version of the platform when finally we see that the transition towards the cloud native tools help us to, to build the platform with the new foundation uh, on, on the infrastructure layer. Uh, the numbers may be not impressive, but we have a stable growth uh, since then and the adoption rate is, is growing and over 400 uh, projects uh, exist on our data and its platform. So that self-service paradigm really helped uh, uh, with the adoption rate. What we, what we built is essentially a product. So the product-driven mindset is something that uh, is embedded in our, in, uh, in our mindset. Uh, using the modern open source technology, what you see here is like an entry point to our platform uh, that allows uh, users to use the significant uh, compute power uh, with the, some security and compliance configuration embedded inside, uh, supporting uh, not only global but also local needs of our users. Three foundation pillars for the self-service platform is scalability, seamless, and security. Uh, we want to emphasize on that uh, engineering capabilities of our platform that engineers can start their uh, data analytics journey using predefined pipelines, building, sharing, testing the deployment, and create, uh, create new insights uh, for the business. Data is stored in a secure way. We, the, what's one of the most important fa uh, factor of the platform is that uh, share, share, sharing resources, sharing data resources with the projects uh, uh, is based on, uh, is based on pre predefined roles. The tool set is, uh, is then also uh, delivered for, uh, you know, the latest tool set is then, is then available for the users. We're looking for the ultimate answer, and in my uh, perfect way, the ultimate answer would be like a search box when the users would like to type whatever I want to do next and everything is going to be taken care of for the users and we guide you through that user journey on the next steps. The rate is a little bit complex. Obviously, you have that uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle that you need to combine to make sure that your uh, platform uh, delivers uh, on the promise. What we think of this is the set of layers uh, that, uh, that you stack up uh, to deliver the end, project, the end product and tailored for the user needs. On that journey, uh, we prepare a couple of uh, interfaces our users uh, can, can, can use on the platform. Uh, what you saw in the previous picture, the landing page, so like a, a, a starting point for the users when they can uh, choose uh, the, the, from the portfolio of the platform uh, the, the products. Uh, we have a, our opinionated data science toolbox uh, that is obviously with the Jupyter notebook interface. Uh, the, 
uh, we recently switched from, from our custom-made uh, build environment towards build packs that uh, helps us to build um, uh, to, to build this environment with data discovery portal. The cooperation with uh, with Lyft, uh, Fox. Uh, uh, help us to uh, enable the data discovery and metadata engine on top of that platform. We have a superset uh, for our uh, BI and analytics needs. The recent transition that happened uh, for us was that uh, that's something that uh, made it possible to transition to our cloud native tools. So we swap, we switch from the Hadoop ecosystem uh, to towards uh, uh, object storage, towards Kubernetes. With the addition of the uh, caching layer, something that uh, also uh, some talks were uh, here yesterday, helps us to achieve proper performance on top of uh, those uh, object storage uh, implementations. The key challenges that we saw so far uh, with, the, uh, with the cloud native tools, uh, yeah, as, as, as you can see, the uh, job, job management, scheduling, and multi-framework support uh, Still, Hadoop was there for us, uh, despite you know leveraging cloud-native uh, technology like Kubernetes for stateless application. Uh, it was even possible to uh, to set up stateful applications, but still, for the data analytics workloads, we are missing a major uh, schedu uh, ma mature scheduler like Yarnis uh, to enable uh, those uh, jobs running concurrently with the multi-tenant environment. Uh, what, what uh, Yarn was missing, on, in a, on the other hand, was support for those uh, new frameworks that are happening, like TensorFlow, PyTorch. So that's something that we're mostly also looking for, uh, what's gonna be next, next big, big thing uh, for our platform. With that, that's a short transition towards Volcano, and we'll hand it over to Tinko to give you a little bit more details about uh, our implementation. Okay, so uh, hello everyone, on the trail to uh, for a solution. So yeah, um, Chris uh, just uh, told us a little bit about it. I hope uh, you can take this uh, image in mind. Uh, for us, on-premise means that we have a fixed cluster available. And on our uh, previous cluster, we had, this, uh, we had uh, scheduling, which was uh, split between Hadoop and Kubernetes. Essentially, all the big Spark jobs that we ran were happening uh, on our Hadoop Yarn cluster. Uh, for like algorithms, like all these different kind of tasks, and the rest was all fully Kubernetesized. But like the rest of the world, we actually aim for only having Kubernetes, since this makes uh, the whole paradigm much simpler. Um, so here, if you look at from a resource consumption, you um, c uh, could see that if we have a certain split in workloads, Kubernetes and Hadoop, and we then in during the normal uh, office hours, you might see that when the Kubernetes were actually uh, like using somewhat, but not everything. On the Hadoop part, we're definitely, uh, uh, since Spark is, uh, wants to try to use as many resources as possible, we, try, uh, we have many uh, jobs running. But for example, during the night, once we uh, run all big batch jobs, which uh, are happening in our bank, then uh, the, batch over, uh, the batch part is like utilized fully, but like the Kubernetes part is barely using anything. Uh, although on peak capacity, you could see like that's, uh, that all different kind of things are being used. Um, you might see that this is not very an optimal way of uh, allocating. And what also is important to us is that we uh, have a distinction between batch and user. So in interactive sites are the people that are using the platform immediately. Batch are like the big processes that we have to finish on time, so to say, for business uh, critical applications. If we, for example, have a full Kubernetes cluster uh, and we run all the Spark jobs on top of it, then the research load might look like this, where we have, uh, for example, the pods running and all the, the, the all essentially all available space that the pods and the core servers aren't using it, and a little bit of spare capacity for the rest of the deployment. Will be, um, will be available for Spark to use. So that, this means that even, for example, during the nighttime, then our batch processes, uh, we might be, uh, I said it, we have much, many more resources to use. So essentially, this is where uh, Volcano uh, comes in. Um, 
there are uh, different, uh, many approaches, but essentially we need a, a job scheduler for Kubernetes, specifically currently for Spark, but in the future for different kind of technologies. And what Volcano offers is that it has job queues with weighted priorities. It has the ability that you can, uh, essentially queues are like the, the ways how you div uh, divide the cluster up. So if there are four users uh, running on the cluster, then everybody gets one fourth of the cluster to use. So their job uh, can complete as fast as possible. But also the uh, ability has, has um, to commit above the queue limits. So if, for example, if two users aren't using anything, then other users may use their resources. So it's like a system that you try to keep, uh, try to uh, claim as many resources as possible. And it also has the main ability to preempt pods when more pods can come in. Um, and the, uh, lastly, it also has configurable strategies to deal with competing workloads. For example, uh, from a task scheduling perspective, uh, for example, Spark, it is, uh, it is uh, how you say that, you can preempt machines, you can kill machines, and then the job will still continue. For TensorFlow, this might not be the case. Um, all these different, these features, these are already exist, only they only exist in Yarn and not in the Kubernetes, uh, uh, I said it in the Kubernetes eco ecosystem. So since the uh, f uh, release of 3.3.0, does Spark officially have support for Volcano? This is uh, by the community. Um, I, uh, uh, this was made by the Volcano community itself. And uh, there's also a uh, another workload um, batch scheduler called Unicorn which is now supported in the latest release of 3.3.1. Um, so I will tell you more about Volcano along the way. If you, um, but Volcano essentially is a generic task scheduler. So we, uh, as we see it, you, just, you have service scheduling and you have task scheduling and all different kind of tasks, which like have a certain predefined moment that it will stop. That's like TensorFlow, Py uh, PyTorch, Spark and Kubeflow, and you can think of any uh, other uh, application on top of it. And essentially the, uh, the configuration is, now I wouldn't say simple, but uh, I, I wouldn't say easy, but it's more like it tries to be uh, as, um, as uh, simple as possible. So you just have a job object, which is a small abstraction of, uh, on top of pods. Um, in which you can select the amount of replicas that you want to use, scheduled by, and you can also add policies, like for example, if the entire job is completed, then I will want, uh, for example, if every pod is completed, then I will uh, want uh, things to, uh, so that the job is completed, but also things like I want, if a certain job uh, pod is, uh, doesn't work, then it should restart like five times. And it has this pluginable architecture in which you can select, okay, I want to use different kind of plugins. Um, and there are different kind of actions that can happen within Volcano itself. And uh, then also you have this queue part, which is specifically needed for our uh, Spark setup, which I will demonstrate later. So it's just a, a, a relatively simple overlay on top of the Kubernetes API. Um, so if you would look at uh, Volcano, then also it, it actually encompasses out of three different services. You have the admission service, which will check if uh, everything uh, is correct. Then also you have the controller manager, and then you have the scheduler, and the scheduler is the main one making decisions um, where to allocate the task, etc. So for, uh, let's get into the balancing kind of uh, situation. So what the main differences is that uh, I want to uh, move forward is that the, there are quite a bit of differences in strategies, how you want to schedule pods uh, from a service perspective and from a job perspective. For example, if you have services running in Kubernetes, you want them to be spread as much as possible so that you, if there's a certain node that fails, then you can uh, still resume the rest of the services and you have a lot of redundancy. But this is not the thing that actually with for like high performance jobs that you want to do. You essentially want to put the jobs as close as possible to, so you have less network traffic and so that it comp can complete faster. 
Um, but uh, also you might want to have that, for example, the applications of all different users are spread as much as possible so that you don't get like in competing workloads on one node. Um, so what you here can see is that for this task scheduler well in Kubernetes, it's uh, mostly like by spreading all the pods, is that Volcano actually has many different uh, plugins attached to it. So you can have like uh, DRF, which is the dominant resource fairness algorithm, which I will get into. You can have gang scheduling where you say, okay, I want to only deploy all the four pods when all the resources like are available for all four pods. So that's like no uh, pod is hanging. I want to add priorities. I want to add uh, resource quotas. I want to add SLA. So that, for example, I want to check whether uh, certain pods, if there isn't available space, that it doesn't take too long. So there uh, are many different kind of algorithms you could uh, think of when uh, you approach it from uh, task scheduling. And this might mean, uh, this means for us that we can further optimize the uh, traffic of Spark in the Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, this is very important to us because essentially in the old YARN cluster, this was highly dedicated for our Spark job. So this has been optimized by by, uh, by many years of experience. And in Kubernetes, we essentially now still have to do it by ourselves. The main feature that was important for us and which why we essentially selected Volcano is that we needed to have dominant resource fairness, um, which they have enabled. So for example, if you have uh, two users, and for example, yeah, uh, now currently, let's assume that you have a cluster with uh, 18 CPUs on the one side, and you have around, let's say, 24 times 3, uh, 72 gigabytes of memory, <laughs> then um, you would like that, that uh, both users can use uh, as many CPUs as possible so that no of their jobs uh, I said that cannot execute. So you uh, want to have a situation where one user can have nine CPUs and the other user also gets nine CPUs in the system. Um, but that will. Uh, uh, but if one user is using less, then that might mean that you use twelve CPUs and the other user user use uh, six CPUs. So this is the part of like you have a weighted claim. And uh, this is done in Volcano Uses Views, and you can overcommit on unused resources from another process. And calculations, uh, the dominant resource fairness, so the, the calculations are done on the most dominant resource which is being used. So in this case, that's CPU, because memory is used uh, way less, and there's even some available space. Um, that means that in Volcano, uh, resources are preempted. Uh, once, for example, user one wants to use more resources, that means that uh, pods from the user two will be deleted uh, to make space for user one. So if we would go to a stack up, then there's also the part of resource starvation. For example, if you have two nodes to your uh, available, then uh, you want to have long running uh, services, for example, with us that is like Presto Trino, or we have a cache like Alexio, which are like, uh, we run on every surface, so we have uh, also different kind of compute options, and also we have a, lot, uh, a caching layer, so we can access data as fast as possible. That means that the rest of the space is essentially available for tasks, but yeah. We also, uh, if we use everything for tasks, that might mean that we cannot do any deployments anymore, or we cannot make any changes. So, for example, we added uh, some available uh, uh, available uh, parts to it so that you can uh, have always have some spare capacity in the cluster so that we can do deployments and uh, without any issues. Uh, wait, next part. Whoa. From Spark itself, it actually, uh, we have made some custom changes on the top of Spark uh, in, in Volcano itself. But uh, for us, uh, it would look like this, where you say, okay, I want to use, in my Spark config, I want to use Volcano. Then you can define, okay, I want to use root user one, that is my uh, queue name. And then I want to use this group name, this pod group, where all these pods are 
I said it, uh, uh, I said it this abstraction over it. Um, Spark itself will create this queues and both, uh, both groups automatically uh, within our setup. And then uh, st these starter pods are automatically assigned to the Volcano pod group that you have uh, declared. We have owner references and driver heartbeat for gar garbage collection. So that means that if somebody's Spark session, uh, Spark driver will stop, then the executors will go down itself. This is, uh, the, uh, this is how it's done in the Spark. And then we have max spending pods as uh, an option to limit the amount of allocation. So Spark is trying to ask as many resources from the Volcano scheduler as possible. And uh, if, uh, if you limit it by us, then it will um, ask for less and less. Uh, uh, is that, yeah, okay. But um, the main part is, is that we have a dynamic allocation uh, uh, being used. So if you're running, for, ex uh, for example, now for the user, like the main resource requirements are as much, I said that, um, uh, hidden away from, from them as possible. They just uh, get a Spark pod uh, in which they can run their query. For example, if they need more resources, then Spark automatically will ask Volcano, like, can I have more pods? Can I have more pods? Can I have more pods um, to execute the uh, process, the job as fast as possible? And then it comes to a small demo, which I wanted to show. <laughs> um, here comes the uh, part which uh, I will say is that we work in a highly re regulated bank, so I cannot show you our Kubernetes uh, commands and etc. So because there might be some sensitive information uh, lying around, but I can show you, for example, now the Grafana da dashboards, which I have uh, updated a little bit, in which we run Spark. So and this I think will immediately make it clear for you guys how it works. So for example, if you I'm adding one user to it. It will automatically ask more executors, executors, as much as possible, and it will try to fill up the cluster as much uh, as full as possible. So that will be like 40 for uh, 34 executors. If suddenly a second user is being added, that means that automatically that first user is being downscaled. So like his pods get killed off, and make room for the second user to come in. And then that will balance itself again, and then you have both have 17 executors to your, uh, uh, to their, uh, uh, how you say that, to their leverage, and the, they, uh, their job is like still running on the background. And if you add a third user, then it will automatically scale itself back that everybody has around, I think around nine executors, some, uh, sorry, 12 executors. And there you can see the amount of CPU and memory being used. So in this situation, you also see on the right uh, 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 parts that like we tend to use all the resources as possible. And if, for example, you remove, and, uh, let's go back a little bit. If, for example, we try to remove user three, that means that uh, essentially we can divide the cluster back to uh, two people again, so they will get back more resources if needed. In this situation, you have like a static uh, allocation of the cluster, but then you manipulate how many resources a particular job or user gets. Uh, it helps you to, you know, have the cost at bay and giving as much power as possible to specific jobs. If the cluster is empty, the user gets full capacity of the cluster. If new users are coming, they are sharing the resources. And there was something really missing in the in the case to bring yeah. that data analytics computation towards Kubernetes. Exactly. And uh, for example, if we didn't have Volcano, then we would, for example, for every user, we have to limit the namespace and the resource requirements. That, but that means that they. Uh, can only use like many less resources because we statically have to declare it, um, then there is available in the cluster. So this is for us, like from a resource consumption standpoint, this is very much needed. And if we don't give it unbound, then essentially they will fill up the cluster and then we can't do any deployments anymore. Uh, so back then, if we, for example, then all Spark uh, uh, processes are killed, then uh, you will see then that I think uh, uh, everything uh, is going down. This is uh, all being ran using Spark Interactive now. So that's uh, quite nice. So um, yeah, this is just with these commands and they can just do anything on top of it. And uh, we provide this dashboard to the users, but essentially most of this is hidden away. 
so they uh, they might uh, they might complain if many users are in the system and they get less space, so to say, about performance, but they won't, they will always get the option to run their Spark job. Uh, so then into a little bit of mo uh, workload monitoring. Uh, we have uh, also, I wanted to show you a bit, but that's uh, still not done, is that we also uh, can have a DRF dashboard in which we want to show a little bit more fine-grained in more hierarchical situations that we have one root queue, we have an interactive queue, which you know interactive views are, and we have a project queue in which all the big projects are that we run. And for example, there we can give the project queue more priority over the rest, so that our, crit uh, I said, a business-critical uh, Spark applications always get more resources to their consumption, uh, uh, to their... Uh, it's useful if you have like a batch job, CTL job that needs to have like a higher priority because they need to finish to, to bring new data to the cluster, but then you have those uh, rest divided uh, up uh, for the interactive queues for interactive user sessions. Okay. And then also uh, we want uh, to essentially avoid traffic jams. And then also uh, we were thinking about adding some cluster rush hour uh, part in which we can give the user a little bit more context about like probably when uh, the cluster is more uh, more used at the moment. So that's a more from a self-service kind of UX yeah. perspective because we essentially want to make this uh, hidden away as much as possible. As you see, it's like we are eliminating, eliminating the toil for data engineers, data analysts. So they start their session, they do not care uh, about the configuration of the cluster, they run their job and they get the best performance possible. What we also want to make it visible to, towards them, you know, where we're gonna be the best uh, time to, uh, during the day that you can run your job because the cluster is less busy. Exactly. So, um, since I, I'm not a Volcano maintainer, I want to just give all the f love to all the Volcano folks that essentially made this terrific scheduler. They did a really great job. I personally also think they did a um, they, that this is like the best way to go because they have a nice uh, uh, nice abstraction over how we can try to make task scheduling more formal in Kubernetes and how we can get more performance out of it. Um, I'm uh, not a very great open source worker. <laughs> so uh, these things uh, are working and uh, with uh, a small amount of uh, changes on top of it, but is, I haven't open sourced it myself. So uh, hopefully if somebody from Volcano is here, I, we can talk. Um, we have added the DRF dashboard, we added spare space, automatic queue management, more Prometheus metrics, updates to the Grafana dashboards, cube state metrics, and uh, they uh, leverage some cluster-wide permissions, and I have reduced that a bit. Uh, but essentially, the, what, they have, uh, what is all done is uh, working, and uh, I think definitely this is the way to go, and it would be uh, cool in the future to also support like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, like different kind of distributed uh, methods. So we can uh, add all different kind of tasks um, on top of Kubernetes this way. Uh, then I want to conclude my presentation.